For those of you who read this, I am sure there will be little interest in my name, but for the sake of history's documentation, I will include it in this record. I am known as Jules Vernet, and I am the son of a New England baker and his wife, the daughter of a little-known Polish actor. I was born here, in the United States, some 20 years ago, and was raised as an apprentice in my father's shop in Maryland with seven other siblings of whom I was the oldest. If how I came to be involved with the events which I am about to relate is a matter of coincidence or fate, I cannot now say for certain. I was young and naive when I first heard the teachings of a certain minister known as Father Pryor. At the time, I was searching for meaning and adventure in my existence, and upon first hearing his words, I was taken absolutely by the zeal of his vision. Father Pryor had constructed a large log structure in the back country, which had become the center hub of his small group of followers. They who referred to themselves as members of the Vale of the Hidden. The name of this peculiar sect was derived from the biblical verse of the 2 Corinthians 4, 3, which reads, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The foundation of Father Pryor's teachings originated in the belief that there were hidden mysteries in many of the Bible's passages which he had decrypted via a God-given spiritual vision. One of the core truths which Pryor had uncovered was that God's Son, Jesus Christ, existed still on the mortal world and walked, even now, amongst us, hidden. Also, he believed that the Dark Other, Satan himself, roamed incarnate and real in the realms of men. It had become the primary goal of his ministry to find one or the other where they existed, as he had been informed by visions and dreams in the wilds of the uncharted American Northwest. It had been just a few years earlier that an expedition along the Great Missouri River had charted a course into these areas by two men commissioned by President Jefferson himself. It was Father Pryor's belief that the Savior could be found living in the wilds amongst the natives of the northern wilderness. It was his goal to assemble his followers and take them on a journey to locate the Messiah. I had joined Pryor's parish only a year before the group had begun preparations for a long and difficult journey up the Missouri from a starting point in St. Charles. Father Pryor had spent a great deal of time and money, mostly gathered from the members of his parish, acquiring materials and information which he would require on his journey. His primary interest lay in the stories which he had been told concerning the Mandan Indian tribes of the Northern Territory. From tales he had heard from returning traders and hunters, he had come under the notion that hiding amongst these tribes was none other than the Son of God. Pryor had been told that the Mandan's religion was based on the existence of a known man who was their primary deity and first human being. It had become central within Pryor's theology that the lone man was in fact the Messiah of Christian doctrine, and it would be the members of the Vale who had been chosen to find him. Our group was made up of some 30 adult followers. The children of the parish were left with various relations, leaving me as the youngest member to be allowed on the journey. It was late March when we left by canoes down the Missouri. The weather had just warmed, and the snows of winter had melted and raised the level of the river substantially. I can still remember the feeling of adventure I felt as I paddled along, absorbing the scenery around me. The trees were still bare and ground barren for the long winter as the current carried us out into the wide expanse. Our mood was joyous as we camped that first night and listened to Father Pryor tell us of the marvels we would behold when we found the Savior, who by his belief was waiting us in the north. The journey was, for the most part, without trial in the first weeks. We arrived at Fort Mandan, and from there, after meeting our translator and guide, a trapper named Philip Henry, continued on. We were told to beware the Lakota, who were hostile to whites, and considered to be more of the savage native tribes we might encounter. Father Pryor assured us that we would not have to pass into Lakota territory as our path was into the land of the Mandan, who were known to be friendly. We all knew, however, that our trail would lead us across wild country where Christian missionaries had not yet passed. We left our boats at the banks of the river near a large Mandan settlement, and upon encountering these strange people began questioning them as to the more secluded settlements which lay further north near the land of the Cree. 
The Mandan were alike other natives we had encountered in dress and appearance, but also were possessed of a great many different qualities than their fellows. They were very tall and attractive people, with a lighter skin than the other Indians. It was rumored that further north, some were born with light-colored brown or sometimes even blonde hair. There were those scholars who had conjectured that this was due to some ancient intermingling with some lost European lineage. Father Pry believed that this was evidence of their contact with a higher being, whose energies had blessed them with a superior continence. As further proof of his theories, he pointed to the Mandan's villages, which in opposition to the moving tent dwellings of the other tribes, were actually domed earth homes, where they resided permanently year-round. Father Pryor eagerly inquired of any myths and legends concerning the Lone Man, and the constantly grilled us with bits of information he acquired. We were told that the Mandan religion was primarily made up of belief in two entities or gods, to which of all creation is attributed. The first being Ki no Makachi, the creator, who was often depicted as a coyote, and the other called Numak Mahana, or the Lone Man. Father Pryor was convinced that this was a perfect mirror of God and God's Son as described by Christian faith. Many of us had wondered why the first god would be compared to a wild dog, but Pryor explained that this was simply an influence of the other Besa Indian cultures who revered the coyote as a deity. It was only in the days after we began our sojourn across the land into the wilderness with only our guide to lead us that we had first become aware of the danger in which we had placed ourselves. The land which we traveled were completely uncivilized and overrun with wild beasts, which seemed to constantly trail our every step. Here in the north, we were beset by storms and frightening rains, which seemed to bend every tree to the very ground. Many nights, we could find no shelter but for shallow caves beneath the rock outcroppings amongst the forested hills. All this we endured with the assurance of Father Pryor that we would soon find a yet undocumented tribe of Mandans living somewhere in the unsettled forests. The days passed in an agonizing blur of climbing and hiking through treacherous dense forest and rocky steep climbs. There were no maps to follow, and Philip guided us only by what directions were given to him by the hunters of the villages we had left weeks previous. It was on our bright and warm morning in what was most likely early June that we first beheld a serene and beautiful valley nestled amongst the cliffs of a now green and lush forest. There, at the basin of the valley, was a clearing where we spotted a collection of the large domed lodges we recognized as Mandan dwellings. As we made our way toward the village, we first were spotted by women who were tending what appeared to be cleared gardens. Upon seeing us, they fled into the village with the small children who stood at their sides. One young girl stood silent for a moment while the others retreated, and I swore that she was staring at me intently before another older woman grabbed her and pulled her away. Father Pryor and Philip the Trapper told us to wait at the edge of the settlement as they bravely went onward alone to meet the warriors who were gathering along the path ahead of us. Priya met with a tall and imposing warrior, who we guessed was the leader of the village, and to the credit of these isolated people, he was greeted much the same as was any stranger approaching a town with such a group as ours would be back in the settled states. They spoke for what seemed an eternity before he and Philip returned with flashing smiles of excited merriment. Priya gathered us together and loudly proclaimed, God has blessed us, my children. We have found those of whom we have sought. We have been expected by them for many weeks now. The holy man of their village had foretold of our coming. I was told that our journey was not in vain, for indeed the lone man arrives here each year in the spring. Tonight there will be a great celebration in the honor of his arrival, and we have been invited to attend. Father Pryor's eyes were wild and fiery with fanatical revelation as we embraced each other and called out our thanks to God for allowing us to be blessed in such a way. We settled and made our camp in the outskirts of the village and laughed with gratitude as several of the men and women brought us food from the town. 
We were amazed as they brought forth great skins filled with what we had expected to be water, but instead were shocked to find deep burgundy wine poured into our waiting cups. Do you see, Father Prior said in an intense rapturous tone as he grabbed my shoulder. It is wine, Jules, the blood of our savior served to you by savages in a wild country. It is yet another proclamation from God on high that here lies a great and hidden truth. I nodded in agreement as I sipped from the cup and found the taste strong and intoxicating. Do you see those vines growing upon the fence rows by the forest, Philip had said in his husky French accent. Those are grape vines. I smiled with wonder as our party ate and drank until noon when we settled beneath our canopies and napped throughout the latter part of the day. I had awakened a few hours later and with blurry sleep heavy eyes watched as I saw a large collection of warriors from the village leaving in a group down a path into the woods with many of the small children of the village in tow. I looked over to see Philip leaned on his elbow still sipping wine from a metal cup. Where are they going? I asked in a whisper, so as not to disturb the other still sleeping members of the group. Perhaps they go to hunt in preparation for tonight's feast, he answered sluggishly. But why bring the children? I again questioned as I saw the last of the men and men and children pass beneath the boughs of the forest trees. Don't concern yourself, mon ami. These are peaceful people. I put my trust in Philip's assurance and laid back down to return to my slumber. When I awakened, again the sun was already descending over the tops of the distant hills, and a massive bonfire had been lit to the center of the village near a large tree which Philip had explained was representative of the lone man. Yes, Father Pryor had added as he pointed to the large white box sycamore, a tree like a crucifix. That is strange though, Philip had commented. I have never seen a sycamore fig this far north. A collection of young lovely women arrived at our camp to lead us into the village and my escort was none other than the girl who had seemingly stared at me upon our first arrival. As we walked along the path I could hear drums and singing from a circle of girls who gathered around the fire. I saw that there were baskets of food and bowls of wine laying at the roots of the great tree as a younger woman swayed and danced around the fire. We were seated in a circle outside of the activity, and once more wine was passed and skins between us. The female members of our group were encouraged to dance with the women of the tribe, which they did at the behest of Father Pryor. I had noticed that the young girl who had walked beside me did not dance, but instead sat at my side silently. I had begun sipping wine from a wooden bowl when she gently placed her hand on mine and pushed the bowl from my lips. She said something in her native tongue, and Philip, who was nearby, looked over and slurred. She doesn't want you to drink. She says you are too young. I had begun to protest when I saw the concern in her eyes, and any argument I might have made melted in her beauty. I smiled and resolved myself to enjoy the celebration with complete sobriety. As the sky fell into a starlit darkness, the dancing became more wild and fervent, and I began to see flashes of exposed skin amongst the native women as their dear skin tunics began to loosen and fall to the ground. I was shocked by this clearly non-Christian display of lurid provocativeness, but found the other men of my group entranced by the song and the sight of the women's writhing bodies. Even the women of our own parish who danced among them had begun to sweat and pull at their bodices as they basked in the heat of the nearby flames. Father Pryor's eyes were glazed with intoxication as he continuously stared back at the tree, as if in some private council with his inner thoughts. There was a time later in the evening as the drumming fell into a low, steady rhythm like and the beating of many hearts in unison that I saw all eyes turned to the tree. I watched with fascination as a crack began to form from the base of the roots up into the parting joint of the lower limbs. To my amazement, it seemed as if a light were burning from behind that crack, as it began to widen with a creaking sound as the wood became pliable and soft. I heard soft whispering at my side and realized it was the young man and girl who was speaking to me as if I could understand. Philip was listening, and the strange events which were unfolding seemed to have sobered him into a sharp, fearful curiosity. She says he only comes once a year, in the spring 
be translated as the crack in the tree now is a gaping man-sized portal of bright shining white light. Who? I whispered. The lone man, he answered as I began to see a shadow forming within the brightness as if from the depths of a long tunnel. I felt a chill pass over me as the shadow became clearer and more detailed. Father Pryor had fallen upon his knees in prayer as we beheld our first glimpse of the tall being which stepped out from the brilliance and into the ground with white bare feet. He was dressed in a long robe of dark crimson which hung open at his chest to reveal a smooth, hairless skin like a child's. His hair was long and brown with streaks of light gold that shone in the firelight as he stepped forward. The face which I saw behind a soft flowing beard was tranquil and pale with enormous shining eyes that could be of no other color than lavender. He moved with the soft grace of a cat and his beauty paled that of the dancing women around him. He walked amongst us and I swear by all that is true I felt a heat radiating from the beam which rivaled that of the great fire. Our group was mesmerized and many had fallen into cries of joy and hysterical weeping. Father Pryor approached and threw himself into the dust before the man and bathing his bare feet in tears proclaimed, I have come to you my lord. We your humble servants have heard your call and come. The being looked down with calm and emotionless eyes as he gently placed a hand on Pryor's head before walking around him and seating himself on a mound of furs before the fire. Women of the tribe immediately began bringing him baskets of food and a bowl of wine as the dancing once more resumed with renewed intensity. Could it truly be him? I asked Philip. Who else knew me? He answered with awe. I don't know, but he just doesn't look how I imagined him. Philip did not answer, but he nodded a silent agreement as the drumming once more began to dwindle into the same pounding pulse as before. The singers had stopped, and the dancing had become languid and slow, as if they were now afloat in water. All seemed remarkably still as a sound began to find its way on the wind. They drifted through the trees like the low call of a bird, but as I listened I realized it was the song of a flute echoing over the entire moonlit valley. What is that? I said, as the melodic tones sent a shiver down through my very bones. The girl took my hand in hers, which was frightfully cold as with fright, and she whispered, Ki Numakachi. My eyes widened, and my tongue fell dry as my gaze met Philip's own. And there I saw fear, like I had never seen in a man's expression. The girl was whispering to him and gesturing for him to translate to me. She says that both come in the spring, but that the coyote stays in his cave and watches from the hill. She warns that the people are forbidden to disturb him other than to leave offerings at the mouth of his cave. I saw that the women who danced continued swaying like enigmatic turning leaves falling from autumn limbs, but others were gathering baskets and wine as they began walking into the darkness as a solemn procession. It is him, Father Pryor called out. He now stood before them pointing at the hills. It is the dark other, as I have foreseen. He turned and bowed before the being that had arisen from the tree and holding his hands together pleaded, Let me face him, my lord. Let me confront man's enemy and show him I have no fear of his treachery or temptation. The man stared at him as if at a lunatic. He said nothing but turned his head and watched as the maidens once more began to whirl and turn faster with the rising pulse of the drums. The girl at my side now gripped Philip by the sleeve and was urgently speaking and waving her hands at Pryor. Philip nodded his comprehension and slowly arose. Father Pryor, he said calmly, I've been told that it is forbidden to disturb the one who rests in the hills. But this is why we've come, Pryor shouted. We stood in the presence of Christ himself and it is our vow to show him our devotion. 
Who will come with me to face Satan and denounce his power before the Messiah? Moved by his words, I began to stand with several of the others and found the girl's hand locked on mine like an iron vice. She stared at me coldly as she nodded her head from side to side. Something in her look filled me with dread, and I backed down to sit at her side once more. I watched as Pryor and some ten other men began to stand and follow the group of women which walked into the forest. The remaining few sat with me and the French trapper watching as the others disappeared into the night following the sound of the haunting melody which played in the darkness. The others seemed overwrought with shame and were whispering to each other that they had failed Pryor and their Lord God. Philip showed no such guilt and was listening as the girl was hastily speaking in a panicked hush. I looked at him as he said, she wants us to go. She says that we are in great danger if the other whites should disturb Coyote. I looked around and saw that now the dancers were wild and ecstatic as they ripped at their remaining clothes and pulled at their own hair in frenzied abandon. The being only sat silently and watched as even the women from our group seemed lost in this tormented excitement. Philip stood confused as he walked to the edge of the firelight away from the group and gestured for me to follow. The girl was pulling at my arm and pushing me to accompany him. Come on, Jules, Philip said, waving for me to join in. This is no Christian mass. As I looked into the Indian girl's frightened, desperate face, I was overtaken by fear. It was then that I heard echoing across the basin of the valley, a horrifying and unearthly howl like no animal I had ever heard. Following this cry were the screams of men bursting from the depths of the forest. I moved to the trapper's side and watched these dancing women suddenly stopped in place and stood panting like naked rabid beasts at the remaining men of our parish. From the woods where the men had went on the tail of the Indian procession came a single bloody figure which ran from the night and fell to the earth by the fire. It was Father Pryor. His arm had been ripped from its socket and his face torn from his skull, leaving only a wretched bloody mask of bare white teeth and bulging terrified eyes. It was at that moment that the dancers fell upon what was left of our group screaming and clawing at them in horrid and relentless fury. The being from the tree was standing and turned to look upon us with his soft and feminine features. He raised his arm and pointed to the path on which we arrived. Philip startled me from my paralyzed trance as he grabbed my arm and pulled me with him as he fled into the darkness with the cries of the others ringing out in the night. If it were not for Philip's knowledge of the land and techniques of survival, I never would have made it back through the wilderness. Terror gave us strength as we clambered over rocks and through streams until we at last arrived at another Mandan village after many days wandering the forest. We did not speak of what had occurred, but it was evident that these people had at least some knowledge of what had transpired in the north. We were given food, and in the last of the villages a canoe in which to return to the east. At Fort Mandan, we lied and said that our group had been attacked by Lakota when we stayed too close to their lands. We knew that no one would believe our tale, and so we parted ways in St. Charles and vowed to never speak of it again to another living soul. In the years that followed, no matter how I struggled to forget the events of that journey, I was still plagued by nightmares of what had befallen the beloved Father Pryor and those devout men who had followed him into the shadow of death. In these dreams, I saw through Pryor's eyes and walked in his boots as he climbed to the mouth of a great cave which sat amongst the rocks of the hillside. There from within the bowels of the cavern I could hear the clear notes of the sorrowful and tranquil song which played. I watched as the women laid out the offerings, and then despite their urgings to return to the village, Pryor stood forth and called into the cave. Come forth, fallen Lucifer. Come forth and face the righteous might of the truly faithful. It was then that the 
these dreams became frightfully clear and vivid as the music ceased and I saw a figure emerging from the cavern, huge and terrifying. It stooped beneath the ceiling of the cave as its head appeared in the moonlight covered in long shaggy fur with a face that seemed an intermingling of man and beast. It held in its long clawed fingers a strange instrument of tied reeds as it gazed upon Priya with a demented rage and savage wild hatred. In these dreams, I could feel the horror and triumph of Priya as he stood bravely before the towering monster and damned it to return to its pit in Hades. It was always then, just as Priya spoke, that condemnation that I saw another emotion flicker in the horizontal lined goat eyes of the creature. Mockery and amusement as it opened its wide beastly mouth and let forth the unearthly cry I had heard myself in the valley below. I could feel the terror and panic in Pryor as the thing lunged forward and snatched him by his arm from the ground like some ragged patchwork doll. I was always awakened in screams as the thing's face came inches from Pryor's own until the scent of wine could be detected on its hot breath. For hours after awakening, I could remember the words Ki Nu Makshi spoke to Priya before it sent him screaming into a horrible bloody death. But I understand them, I could not. Then, just a few months ago, I was traveling along the southern east coast when I was passing through a small fishing village. I heard a man shouting on the street he was a stocky, dark man with wavy black hair and beard, wearing an apron as he commanded a boy who I supposed was his son to carry a box in from where it stood on the sidewalk. I listened as he spoke and was immediately stricken by the similarity of the sound of his words bore to the voice I had heard speaking to Pryor in my dreams. I approached him and he greeted me with a smile. Hello, sir, he said with a thick, strange accent. Perhaps you would care for a meal. I have the freshest fish in town. I told him that indeed I was hungry, and he took me inside and seated me at a small table. He offered me wine, but I refused since I have not partaken of the drink since that night long ago. He substituted coffee, and as he poured, I asked him where he was from. I was born and raised in Sicily, he answered. I told him that I had heard him speaking in his native tongue and wondered if perhaps he knew the translation for the particular phrase I had heard. I repeated the words I had heard the thing from my dream speak as best as I could pronounce. And the man smiled broadly after I had uttered them. Yes, of course. These words you are speaking are Greek. I felt the same cold chill of fear which I had felt that night as I heard the song of the strange things instrument playing over the valley. What do these words mean? I asked. He looked at me with a strange expression as if he were unsure if I were serious in my inquiry. Then holding out his hands, he answered, they mean I am Pan. <laughs>